going to start to talk. <laughs> so, um, so I will start with Shannon. Um, that uh, I, I've known Shannon in the past, um, I don't know, two years already. Uh, by us from our city, and um, uh, I'm very, very happy for her to be coming here as an artist in the city, uh, working with the um, artistic intelligence of the of what's going on in the city of Toronto, and then bring the policy from the bottom up to the uh, to the greater area. Um, Shannon, would you like to talk a little bit about yourself and your life? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, so maybe I'll just say that Leslie and I are here today on behalf of a cohort of, of folks. And so there are eight of us in this cohort, and you'll get a chance to, to meet all of us. But uh, Greg Frankson is in the room with us here, <laughs> Leslie Ting and myself, and then online, uh, Debbie Feltman, Evelyn Perry, and Sherry Boyle are in the Zoom room. Uh, and then there are two others who couldn't be with us, Kevin Loring and Kevin Ormsby, the two others. Uh, so just to say, we, we are a cohort of artists who are interested in how our practices can translate beyond their art making aims, And we are already kind of civic actors out there in the world. We're interested in public policy and we've come to an interesting moment in our careers where we're kind of stopping and saying, how, how can we help? How can we help this moment of transformation? So perhaps that's just like a way to <laughs> introduce the bigger picture. So Leslie and I are just here as kind of the representatives of this cohort to share with you some of our thoughts um, and where we've gotten to with our thinking on this question of, of, of what, what do artists and their creative processes have to do with public policy? So thank you so much. Um, so uh, without further ado, please uh, join us to welcome uh, Shannon and me and the team online uh, to begin the conversation. It's very important for Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone um, in the room and also everyone online. Um, I really want to acknowledge everyone that's joined us online because during the pandemic, I got really interested actually in this movement towards hybrid, that totally online towards hybrid and this idea that some people would be in a room, but lots of people would be online. And how do you make this an equitable experience, asymmetrical, but equally considered. So I'm really happy that Evelyn and Deviani and Sherry can be online to also animate, please, everyone, on I guess I look at the camera here. Um, to please, uh, we would love for you all to be active on the chat and um, our cohort members will be chatting with you there. So thank you for joining us for this presentation and discussion on imagining new worlds. We're excited to talk about what it would mean to support artists as world makers in public policy. My name is Leslie Ting, and I'm a musician. I'm a violinist. I come from the classical and new music world. And now I take that into theater spaces and online spaces. Creative accessibility is a big part of my practice, um, in particular because I was uh, a former practicing optometrist. I'm particularly interested in vision. I think a lot about eyesight, the tension between how we see and what, how we listen and hear each other in the world. Um, and one thing that lately in my practice I've been playing a lot with is audio description. And so I'd like to describe the room that I'm in right now. Uh, behind me are is a wall of concrete and windows, floor-to-ceiling windows. And to my right is a similar wall of floor-to-ceiling windows, uh, also concrete. In front of me is a glass wall that looks out onto these cubicles. And to my left um, is a concrete wall with the video screen with our slide presentation on it. And in the room, uh, our white table set up as a rectangle. And I'm sitting at a table with about 25 other people, most of whom I probably wouldn't be at the table with as an artist. And that is the premise of the start of this presentation. Um, and the next slide, please, Cassandra, um, is going to outline this conversation around why that is, why it's not at the table as artists, uh, where public policy in our world is shaped, why it matters, and what we are proposing as a cohort to do about it. So the first section, 
So we'll talk about, we'll bring up a question that sort of synthesizes everything that has brought this cohort together. Shannon wrote an essay that she'll talk about later. Um, and we'll talk about what the transformative capacity of the arts is. And when we talk about the arts, we're talk we are talking specifically about the arts process. The second section of this of our presentation will be about how do we engage the artist as citizen. And I really feel like this requires a paradigm shift in how we think about the artist. And we'll also propose this idea of the public imagination network, which is a working name right now for our this idea and the Toronto cohort, which is the eight people that we that Shannon mentioned are sort of the prototype of this group that ideally would sort of grow across Canada. Um, and then the third, the last um, section of our presentation will be sharing more concrete, what we think might be outcomes of this idea of working together. And we would love to have your ideas throughout the presentation um, or at the discussion, actually, at the end, we'd love to engage with you on <clears throat> think about some of the ideas. Please take notes along the way about what is resonating, where you feel resistance. And this is sort of, for me, the paradigm shift part where you feel resistance with some of these ideas. Any questions that come up for you and ways that your own work might intersect and support our ideas. So moving on, uh, this is the inspiring question. What would it mean for a society to engage with the artist's creative process to create fertile ground from which a healthier, more sustainable, just and caring society could emerge. So this question has a couple assumptions attached to it. One is that we all agree that our society is not particularly healthy, sustainable, just <laughs> caring. We're all on the same page about that, that <laughs> we all have some work to do. Um, and then the second thing is that the artists and their process are valuable to, si to society and can create real societal change. Um, I, we'll get into that more, but this is something that feels to me still like an assumption um, that needs to be that not everyone maybe is 100% on board with actually. So, um, so that's what I'll set the stage with as the question. And um, I'm happy to hand it over to Shannon, who will talk about her essay. Great, thank you. So I'm Shannon Litzenberger, and I know many of you uh, in the room, uh, but some of you I'm meeting for the first time. And I, so I'll just say really briefly that my practice is as a dance artist. And in particular, I've translated a lot of the embodied practices that I use in art making into spaces of leadership development. And so I use the you know embodied knowledge systems that we all have and engage in practices that animate ensemble building, collective creation, better communications, unpacking power dynamics, understanding how we can transgress in generative ways inside systems. So these are the ways that I've been employing these practices um, for about the last 10 years or so. So during the pandemic, um, as I'm sure many of you have, it was it was just a time to kind of reflect and think a bit about this bigger picture. And the question that, that really fueled me is the one that is inspiring us as a cohort right now is like, what is art for and what are we doing as artists out here in the world? You know, and it's it's a bit of a like existential moment, like we're in this big moment of transformation. And so I know there are some folks who've read the essay, so I'm not going to belabor it, but I would like to just for the benefit of, of putting us all on the same page to just share a few of the highlights of what this essay is trying to say. So the essay is, why do we need artists right now? And its central thesis is that if we want to take seriously this imperative of transformative change, then we need to mobilize the work of individual artists and their ability to explore new horizons of possibility through their artistic practices. And that these practices don't have to be limited to making art as a marketplace commodity, that they actually do have the potential to create new worlds. But to do this, we need to change how we think about artists and their work. That, you know, we heard this narrative in the pandemic a bit about artists, how we're kind of like these crazy unicorns that are here to entertain and distract and comfort because we needed that in the pandemic. We needed distraction and comfort and entertainment. 
but this is not our essential work. <laughs> the, our essential work is the one of catalyzing emergence. And so this is what we're trying to really make more explicit. But there are some barriers to really engaging this capacity of artists, and that is, and is what the, the essay is attempting to unearth. And so really one of the biggest barriers for artists is that our work has become uncentered in our own industry, that we are not central in a system of cultural production, that we're the worst compensated workers, we're regularly exploited economically to just keep the engine of the arts and culture sector running, that we know that profits are being redirected away from content creators and toward distributors, that artists are more than ever working for free behind the scenes to access what amounts to mostly underpaid opportunities in the field. And that, you know, it's becoming clear that economic advantages within the system are necessary for creative and professional viability. And that means that to be an artist is becoming a class-based privilege, which is really quite scary, actually. And so this precarious economic situation is intensifying this like artist hustle life and that means that the time and space <laughs> that you have to creatively explore new horizons is really limited that we're not in a space that where we can contemplate reflect experiment and allow this newness to emerge so this is where it's at stake right now <laughs> So in the second section of the essay, I just call attention to the ways that the processes of creation that made Canada have left considerable legacy of harm. And so we're now you know, thinking about how do we design a more just system? How do we uncouple from some of the architecture that built you know, the cultural policies and other policy systems in Canada that we can't just recalibrate an old system? And we also can't reorganize the distribution of power along identity lines while still maintaining the current architecture that we actually need to engage in a much more fundamental process of creation that's organized around new principles, things like cultural plurality, equity and justice, environmental sustainability, creative engagement, collective care, well-being. Like these are all words that you know we're hearing and engaging with a lot right now. And so, you know, we kind of have this tension as artists where. Our role in society is often to reflect on and interrogate systems while imagining new worlds. And this tension between like survival through the competition for resources and cooperation toward collective thriving is just more impossible than it's ever been. Artists very much in this moment need to uncouple themselves from the concepts and structures and dynamics that are producing the current systemic harms. And this is a big act of resistance, especially when you are the, the person in the system that has the least amount of power. So the last one, and this is the one we're going to focus on a little bit more today, is that the creative capacities of artists are not very well understood or applied beyond their art making aims. So these processes of creation that artists engage with when you make art are in and of themselves processes, tools, knowledge systems that have the ability to bring about emergence and can be engaged with in the service of world making. And we'll talk more about what that all means uh, soon. <laughs> but artistic processes are by their very nature emergent. And these processes can work on our ways of being, like our relationship to ourselves, to each other in the world, as well as on our ways of thinking and doing and we do this all in the conditions of complexity and uncertainty that we find ourselves in. So, you know, artists are already experimenting with new ways of doing things. We are inviting new rituals and practicing new ways of collaborating, testing new rhythms, investigating new organizing principles. And these experiments are happening to the extent that they can in studios, rehearsal halls, living rooms, parks, and all in service to culture change. So this was kind of the point of departure for us. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so, but this is our big question. So what actually is the transformative capacity of the arts? And before we share our thoughts on that, in a really brief way, I was hoping just to hear a couple of people offer up a possible response to that question. So we're not gonna go into a deep discussion and there's no right or wrong answer, but I am curious, have you thought about this question? Like what actually is 
the transformative capacity of the arts and what would you say is one of the possible responses to that? And feel free to use the chat online if you'd like to offer up some there. Anyone want to offer up something? There's no wrong yeah, answer. Read on it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can chat if someone's offering from the chat. I'd be happy to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Michael from the Ontario Arts Council. Um, I think I think of societal change. I think of telling new stories. And there's a dominant story. The arts is usually the first to tell the alternative story, mm -hmm. alternate story, and introduce concepts that the general population has not thought of. But obviously, I'm thinking of popular art, um, a popular music person. And so I just think of those stories rising above. They shouldn't be there. You know, they weren't meant to be there. And all of a sudden, they're there. It's like, a, I don't know, Bob Marley. No one was meant to hear, uh, you know, uh, a uh, guy from Jamaica that definitely wasn't supposed to be heard by like 75 or 100 billion or whatever the numbers are. And all of a sudden you have this story that's so much different, but also has lineages to other places. And so I think as a carrier of the alternate story, um, and usually the first, uh, I think, I think it's usually the art. And, and I think that's pretty valuable. Thank you. I can continue with that. Um, so I'm also a big fan of popular music myself. Um, I'm in the music and department. I work with rock musicians in Iran, and um, I think all of you have heard so far what's going on in Iran. And um, I don't want to say this that music has a very particular power over what's going on in Iran, but I think it does. Um, and um, it is shaping the chorus on the street. So transformative as a Big to me, but also transformative in minus scale everyday protests, small acts of resistance. So its transformation is not might not always be audible, but it is definitely like going back to what then uh, how then we began. Uh, but it is very loud, like the hertz is beyond four forty, so that um, dogs even hear it. So the hertz is very high. Yeah, Sandra, do you want to just share a couple of chat? Yeah, I'm just going to share a few. Lighting up in there, so. I'll just put a few randomly and share those. Um, bring people together that would otherwise not engage with each other, creating a new relational infrastructure, spanning beyond known possibilities to express co-created relational context, um, meaning making, expanding discussion capacities, consciousness, expanding communities, allow space for critical thinking, um, to connect human to human and both share their visions for the benefit of society, overall to tell a story through our discipline that educates us all. Um, empathy, uh, allows us to see the potential of empathy and creates a container in which to value their friends. There's more, I keep going. That's great. That's great. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, so here, I mean, I think there are a lot of responses to this question, and our list is certainly not exhaustive, but these are some of the things that we're prioritizing in this process. So the creative process allows us to rehearse new ways of relating, to expand embodied awareness and perception. So what we pay attention to informs the perception of our reality. And so when we expand attentional capacity, we start to, it starts to affect our perception, which affects the decisions we make and the actions that we take in the world. Um, practicing new cultural expression. So what are the rituals, the norms, the codes of behavior, the rules for living? Engaging with imagination. Like, is this a lost capacity in our world that's very data-driven and algorithm-driven? Where does imagination come into how we think about the future? Engaging with risk and emergent possibility, interrogating assumptions, extending the margins of knowing, imagining new futures and building worlds, refusing conformity, averting conventions, building bridges and deepening relations and engaging community. So some of those things were also already said. So I think, you know, what we're really trying to get at is that we need to understand that art is not just an artifact or experience, but that there is also an artistic 
process and or processes, creative processes, creative practices. And these are these are the potential tools and methodologies and approaches that we're interested in investigating and how they act on us. So, you know, artists are very versed in these processes. This is the muscle that we build as artists in order to make art. And so artists are very practiced and specialized in imagining futures that don't exist. We are very skilled at holding multiple truths at once. We are expert at communicating through the sensory and the aesthetic. We channel the power of close attention to disrupt old interpretations of our shared reality. We tell the new stories in new ways. We create new symbols and metaphors. We hatch experiments, we fail, and we try again. And we resituate familiar ideas in unfamiliar contexts in order to prime the public imagination with an expanded set of possibilities. So we as artists are the people in the world who spend time building this muscle of, of what, what can actually bring that transformational capacity into the world. And so we as a cohort know that these capacities are very underutilized in this bigger project of systems change right now, especially at the public policy level. And so we're very interested in translating these applications uh, the application of these tools, you know, toward that aim. So we want to, you know, because we know we have a very smart group in the room, we want to get into the weeds with you a little bit right now and give you some examples of how Leslie and I are actually doing this with our practice. And, you know, hopefully that will bring even more clarity and also potentially like bring up some questions that we can engage with later. So I'm going to turn it back to Leslie to talk about her practice. Thanks, Jen. Um, so this idea of taking our process, which tends to be hidden away, never sees it, and then um, this promise, maybe that sounds kind of grandiose about these tools that will transform the world. Um, are, I have an example in my practice right now that I would like to share that comes from the learning and experience of engaging with making interdisciplinary productions and using creative access. And, currently developing a tool that can be applied to other sectors, hopefully organizations, institutions. So um, again, so that's what this tool is that I'll describe. And then I'll talk about, um, I'll just give, try to give you a window into my thinking and where it came from. Um, and I could talk far and wide about it. So I'm gonna try to write it in, but I'm just, just to give you a hint of sort of how the thinking, how it came about, because I personally feel like this is where if more people understood or saw or got an idea of how this part worked, then you would want to engage with it more. So the tool itself is something um, that I'm formalizing something in my creative practice that I've been doing for years and I'm developing with it, it with foresight strategist Macy Sue, blind and disabled artist scholar Jessica Watkin and Theodore Kasmerai. So this tool is a series of questionnaires and facilitated discussion that we will be designing and refining to gather and harness knowledge and experience with accessibility from everyone on a team. So this differs from having the accessibility expert, which of course I had very early on in my practice, the person with the lived experience who would just sort of, you know, we would just kind of do as we were told this expert down model that tends to happen also in EDI work. Um, but uh, over the years, what I felt was that the more I engaged with um, my colleagues, Alex Ballmer, who's a renowned blind theater artist, and Jessica Watkins, who's a scholar who just did her PhD in this work, is that I wanted more and more for my team, the front of house, the production person, the stage manager, to hear the conversations and have a better understanding of some of the artistic choices we were making to help support it. Um, throughout. When I started working with Theodore Pasmarai as a co-producer on one of my shows, I was really struck by how different it felt to have everybody in an organization on board, everybody thinking about accessibility. I wasn't the only one that was sort of saying, oh, but if you do that, then if you can't see, you won't be able to experience this thing. So it was a way of, I, I was constantly checking because it is an interest of mine in creative accessibility and also the, the person, the accessibility consultant was sort of always you know, the person checking everyone. So the idea here is to engage people from the beginning, from the ground up to bring their own knowledge. And a lot of people do have knowledge and accessibility of not being able to attend something, physically go somewhere, 
I don't have children, but I, if, you have, if you're a parent with small children, that's enough. You already can't access a lot of things. So, um, for example, um, so this, um, so that sort of, the, this tool is to try to, to do this work, these questions self-reflect, come together as a group and bring everyone's knowledge to the table so that this, the person, um, and I'll just back up for a second. I'll just pause to say that I am a sighted person. And I'm not interested in making anything for someone who's blind or has partial sight, but I was always interested in making something that considered the person who was blind, who had partial sight and who had sight at the same time, not make something totally as a sighted person and then add on audio description at the end. So what would happen if we considered all of these visual experiences throughout the process and considered, tried to make a complete experience, though, different for everyone, but at least complete and equally considered, similar to being in the room together, which is often, you know, it's different than being online, but there's a way of making online feel good too, I think. So um, that's, that's kind of the, uh, that's what I'm hoping to develop with this tool is that this can be applied to any other project. It doesn't have to be something that I'm leading and this is what we're trying to develop. And just to back up into where this came from, where this question came from, when I was making my career change from optometry to music, my mother was using her vision at the same time. And I was really struck by the way her world changed, her ability to communicate, her, her ability to be mobile and independent. But also I could see as someone who was a quote unquote expert in the eye, I was really shocked at how unprepared I was personally to witness the lived experience of vision loss. But I understood sort of from a more physiological standpoint what my mother was seeing, what she was experiencing, why she was frustrated. And I could also see that our sighted family and friends, they kind of didn't know how to be with her, how to sometimes she could, it looked like she could see and sometimes she really couldn't see and it fluctuated and that was very confusing for everyone. So I felt like I was holding all of this like, oh, I can, I can understand why you're frustrated and my mother too, I could see why she was having so much trouble. And I wanted to create a performance that bridged this gap for people. So that's why I was really interested in holding this question from the beginning of development. Can I make a performance that all of these three kinds of blind, partial sighted and sighted can have a complete experience, but I understand that it's different. Um, and so this tool is really about it's not a, this is how you make an accessible thing. It's about bringing, opening something to find more ways of inviting people in. Um, so I think I will sort of draw it to a close by just saying over the years, um, so currently I'm working on a production where we sort of drafted this questionnaire. That's sort of the basis of the proposal as sort of proof of concept that this idea of a questionnaire and, dis and discussions would work quote unquote um and the web developer that i'm currently working with had um i just want to share one of his answers so one of the questions on this draft questionnaire is reflecting back are there any personal or societal assumptions around access that you feel the project has challenged or that you were leaving behind so this project is in mid-development we've done some work in progress showing so we're sort of in the in the middle of this project and this is what our web developer's answer was there was a lot of technology I had to become familiar with to make text accessible to screen readers that in over 10 years of doing this work, I had never engaged with before. I feel like the assumptions I bring in software projects were thoroughly challenged by this project and I'm a better developer for it. So I just wanted to share that as a really direct expression of someone who works in web developing and does lots of other corporate things who now can take with him beyond my project with him, more facility around accessibility, more um, knowledge, experience around doing this work because it is a constant work in practice. Um, so I hope I've sort of demonstrated this idea of my, you know, using this kind of work to, yes, I made a production where we did consider all of these levels of vision, where it was sort of Maybe for some people, the first time they'd heard audio description, but I made it sort of the standard. It wasn't something that suddenly if you're a blind person, you get this extra voice in your head while you're watching this thing at the same time. It's super chaotic if you've ever tried it. And it doesn't 
do justice to the artwork. It doesn't do justice to the person really listening. So I just wanted to do away with that and sort of, um, in some ways, flatten or um, flatten is not a great word, but sort of consider everyone completely and see if we could um, connect everyone in the room that way. Um, so I will pass it now to Shannon to share her practice. <laughs> we can talk more about that if we get anybody who has more questions this later. But we're trying really hard to like rein it in because we, you know, as you know, we can talk about our practices endlessly. Um, but I think I'm going to start by just telling you a bit of a story about how I discovered this connection between my practice as a dance artist and leadership development. So about 10 years ago, I was doing a community engaged art project as part of Toronto's Nuit Blanche. Um, and I, so I was making this sort of durational all night long performance piece that was kind of a series of, of different short pieces. I had a number of different choreographers and a number of different dancers at different career stages. And I also, as part of the kind of team of performers was working with a group of RBC employees. And so I, I started working with this group of RBC employees because my financial advisor at RBC said to me one day that he said, oh, you're a choreographer and I sing as part of a corporate glee club. And, you know, we do like covers of pop songs and stuff. And I was wondering if you want to come and like choreograph for us. And I said, absolutely not. <laughs> that is not at all what I take so long. I kind of sat on it for a moment mm -hmm. and and realized that there was an opening. There was an opening to kind of build a bridge between these worlds. And so I decided to invite this glee club to become part of this performance project that I was building. So in order for us to work together, the bank employees facilitated like access to an auditorium in the downtown office. And I went there every Monday after work, after their work. And um, and we did creative ensemble creation process together. So I didn't actually like create movement and set choreography on them because they're not dancers. So their ability to remember movement is probably not very good. And so we just engaged in this sort of like, you know, ensemble building collective creation process. And because it was so novel that I was working with bankers, you know, we kind of documented this process and interviewed them. And what we found out was that it totally transformed their relationship to work and to each other. And I realized that the people, like they, they were recruiting more people that were kind of not already part of the league club that wanted to be a part of this. And I realized that they were looking for a place to belong and to connect with their colleagues. And this was it. And so in, in gathering that kind of like reflection from them, I realized that my practices and the practices that come from, from performance making have something to offer beyond. So, you know, fast forward 10 years later, you know, I've been, I've really like dove into the research and I realized that the, the biggest challenge of trying to apply creative practice outside of the art world is how you talk about it. <laughs> it's actually becoming, developing this skill as a translator. So that is what I have devoted most of my time. I already have the practices. The practices are there, they're developed. I'm over 20 years of my career. So what I work on is how to talk about what it is that I do. When people hear the word embodiment practice, they're like, oh, do I have to move my body? Like I know that we live in a world that has like disconnected mind and body and imagine those as like different you know, knowledge systems, different, you know, locations of intelligence, and they're really not. And so now through all of the research that I've done, I've been able to apply these practices in really sophisticated ways. So, you know, I've worked with organizations like the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation, for example, and developed curriculum for uh, PhD scholars. I'm working with the Ivy Business School at Western University, and we're, we're uh, researching how to honor power dynamics and develop more co-creative, generative, equitable ways of working in groups. Um, I was working uh, at the BAMP Center through their cultural leadership program, and that's where I met uh, Diane Ragsdale, who I just want to name because we've become, you know, amazing thought partners. And, uh, you know, her work around beauty and aesthetic practice and how she applies that in the world is such a compliment to my work in embodiment. And so 
Syed is now the director of a new creative leadership master's program at MCAD, the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. And so this program is just one year old right now. It's a 15 month program that includes this week long summer residency. So where they all come together in person on relational leadership. So I was very involved in sort of how that curriculum was developed with a number of local faculty. And so we used an all arts based approach to this curriculum, including many, many, many sessions of embodied practice. Um, and so these practices were actually the primary mode of learning and not a kind of like secondary add-on or ancillary workshop that we did to reinforce the core theory, like this was the mode. And so, you know, the curriculum was, was really developed to look at how artists and other creators are means by which to develop these critical lost ways of knowing that are really central to human development and how they support this paradigm shift in leadership. So away from one that is grounded in individualism and competition and scarcity, and one that's really um, moving more toward. We saw the comments in the chat. Yeah. Are you still quiet? Oh, okay. I'm going to talk about it. Okay. Start over. You don't want that. Okay. Okay. So, um, Anyways, I do want to just share a bit of a reflection because some of the themes that we were exploring using embodied practice were around resilience, co-creation, power, knowledge, and transgression as a way of transforming our relationships to self, others in the world. And the first cohort of, of this program, they're not all people who come from the culture sector, right? These are folks who are working in a number of different sectors in society. So I just want to give a little shout out to Megan Zeiler. I think Megan is actually in the um, in the Zoom room, and, and uh, Meg is one of the students in the first cohort. And so they were all asked to write an essay uh, that kind of reflected on this, this residency week in relational leadership. And so with her permission, I'm sharing this quote, which was about how we worked with the idea of transgression. So she says, transgression, related movement, unexpected, chaotic, exaggerated, long pauses, idle stares, intense, commanding, yet neutral. Be clear about what you are doing. The world offers immense possibilities. Fling off your quilt of social norms skip across a field and tell everyone you meet it's okay to sit on the floor of a museum and cry your eyes out. They'll only be startled for a moment. This is not a broken air conditioner. This is remembering a doctor who said your arches were too high to be a dancer and twirling across the grass anyways. So, you know, I'll just conclude by saying that these methodologies are what help us practice uncoupling from the norms that and the logics that define our world now. And that's part of their gifts. All right, I think we'll move forward. Yeah. Oh, and is it still new? Okay. Yeah. Great. All right. <laughs> We're gonna accelerate a bit because we want to make sure we have plenty of time for discussion. But I'll just point out that so you know, now we're really we're we're really aware that artists are very often triaging the social systems that we're not participating in creating. So we're in this moment of transformation, we're being called to help, but we're, we're like the support system on the other side, and we wanna be more involved in the creation process of the social systems that organize our world. And so I'll just, I wanna also give a shout out to Leslie Wright and the philanthropist who's in the room and Patty Pond from uh, Calgary Arts Development Agency. And, and both of these women have uh, supported me and the cohort immensely in just trying to gather together folks who are asking this question. So a group of public arts funders, other uh, academic institutions and artists. So we created an event and we all came together. Some of you were there where we just had this conversation. How do we, how do we engage the capacity of the arts and culture sector and public policy? And, a, and just a couple things to highlight is that, you know, when we consider these transformational approaches to policy action, can we focus where there have been gaps in this process in the past and not just do the same old things that we normally do? So, you know, one of these things, and we hear this a lot in, in our world in general right now, is that the, the participation of those who are economically or otherwise marginalized are very key to change in policy process. Those are the folks who know what is wrong with the system. 
And you know, we do need to enable this kind of on the ground leadership, the in-community policy actors. We saw surges of artists as activists during the pandemic. And what is the distance between that activism and actually influencing a policy direction in society? We want to close that gap. And so we do understand that, you know, the arts is really good at looking inside, right? So we're not talking about acting on cultural policy, though this is, of course, also a very important space. But we need to, we need to look better outwards. And there are a lot of relationships that are underdeveloped in this space. And so um, I just want to ask Leslie to talk really briefly about this experience we had at the public, uh, at the BAMP Forum, because she and I were the first to Arnie Bank Johansson Fellows, which is a fellowship designed for artists to attend a, sec a cross sectoral, nonpartisan policy kind of forum conversation. And some members of our cohort, including Greg and Debbie Ani, were also fellows the following year. Thanks. Um, so, uh, just to be really candid, uh, this is going to be candid about my experience. <laughs> uh, so I went to, I applied to go to this forum because um, I was interested in how the arts and culture were sitting in the sort of larger discourse. I wanted to know. Um, I was quite, you know, as an artist, quite felt quite sort of siloed over here, doing my art thing, and I couldn't really was wanting to feel what it, you know the impact, like the larger impact, or like how are we spoken about. Um, and so I also wanted to sort of hear how public policy was talked about and discussed and, um, you know, be in the rehearsal room, so to speak. Uh, so I, um, you know, there are panels and then there's all these in-between moments where you talk and network with people. And so, so basically the arts and culture were not at all spoken about at this conference. It wasn't on anyone's mind on one panel that was about Canada in 50 years. Um, I asked a question about where does anyone have any thoughts about the arts and culture in Canada? Um, two of them just totally di didn't say anything. <laughs> One sort of spoke very loudly about um, freedom of speech. And then one person sort of did say something about artists being underutilized. And we had lunch later, but she kind of didn't seem to like, we didn't, it didn't go anywhere. So she uh, sort of vaguely understood that we're underutilized, but that was kind of where it landed. And then I think I also heard about Netflix. So that's the level of art and culture we're talking. Freedom of speech and Netflix. So, um, you know, that's not what we are trying to talk about here, not to disparage those things, but, um, you know, I was kind of, I left feeling kind of frustrated and a little bit alarmed, frankly, and a little bit, um, but also galvanized and sort of excited to try to understand why, why this is, why can't I have like meaningful conversations with anyone in any other sector in Canada? I couldn't talk to a senator, I had trouble talking to a senator, transportation people, public policy, venture capitalist. And this went both ways, by the way. So I, they, I got a lot of, I would try to explain what I did and I got sort of like, squinty eyes like oh how interesting and then that's <laughs> that way that the conversation would die and I think I'm a pretty good conversationalist so I don't know if this is a bit, <laughs> that way. It's a bit of a blow to my ego <laughs> but um all this say is just to lead into the next slide about what we're trying to propose here which is um this idea of the public imagination network and so um in the interest of time um just a few words on everybody in this um it's my pleasure to introduce everyone in this group um so Sherry Boyle, who represented Canada in the Venice um, Biennial in 2013, Greg Franson in the room, a recent band fellow, who also just published a book of poetry called Afropanthology, Shannon, uh, Kevin Loring, who's currently artistic director of Indigenous Theatre at the NAC, Kevin Ormsby, who's artistic director of Cash Advance, Evelyn Perry online, who's a former artistic director of Buddies in Bad Times Theatre, Deviani Saltzman, who's also online, uh, also a recent BAMP Forum Fellow and has held senior positions at Luminato, BAMP Center, the AGO, uh, and myself. So we have a, a quite a wide range of experience, I think, with public policy, but we're all deeply experienced in the art and sort of navigating our systems. Great. So I'm going to skip this part, but just tell you what it is that I'm going to skip in case you have a question about it later. <laughs> <laughs> is that, you know, we did identify uh, where are some of these other things happening? So, you know, I, I um, am going to skip over talking about the cultural instigators program at uh, in Calgary, which I encourage you to look up. 
um, which is about uh, artists being supported in an anti-racism strategy for Calgary. And also in the US, the CARE Lab, which is uh, an organization that supports artists in residence programs with the government. And there's been some really interesting research that's come out of there by Amanda Lovely and Joanna Taylor. There's actually a, a, a policy paper, Arts Practice as Policy Practice, which I had to ask one of my academic friends to access for me so I could read it. Uh, but it's a really interesting paper. And then in, the, in Europe, there's uh, an organization called the Reshape Network that has a very cool initiative that I really encourage you to look up called, um, it focuses on art and citizenship and it's, a, and it's called the Department of Civil Imagination. So it's a, it's a fictitious department that a group of artists have invented that is meant to like use language and imagining new futures as a way of triggering where we might want to pay it, like what we might want to pay attention to. Um, so you can always look that up or ask questions about that later. Okay, we're almost finished what we want to say, but we want to just take like a little moment to pause right now and invite you to like stand up. <laughs> we're going to stand up. I know it's a very packed room, so uh, online folks, please feel free to follow along. Uh, somebody asked if we can name the, name the name of that paper again. Yes, it is um, Art Practice as Policy Practice by Joanna Taylor. Um, so what I'd love for us to do, <laughs> this is going to create a little bit of chaos in the room and then it's going to settle. So I just want you to make eye contact with someone else in the room and switch places with them. And we're just going to like do the last two bits of the presentation from a different location in the room. So see someone in the room, <laughs> switch places. We're just going to take you for <laughs> Um, thanks, everyone. Um, so one of the key things to how this group would function that we feel is really important is this idea of staying off the highway. Yeah. Um, staying off the highway. And, um, you know, sort of back to the original assumption that uh, society is not super well right now, not healthy, not caring, not as just as it could be. Um, we feel it would be important to sort of stay out of the larger institutions and sort of stay autonomous and to decide in relationship, in complement, but not in because we feel that we would sort of get sucked back into the status quo pretty quickly and our sort of potency would be diluted. Um, and I'll pass it off to Shannon to sort of talk about how, what that would look like and what we mean by that. Great. So there are a few questions that are kind of guiding our inquiry. How can we engage the imaginative capacity of artists as a collective social practice? How can aesthetic processes and knowledge systems contribute to public policy making? And how do we better mobilize the world making capacities of artists as we aim to engage with these big questions about how our society is organized and governed? So we have, and I think it's okay to just advance and, and share. Um, we really talked a lot as a group about what are the principles that we, of how we want to work together, because the how we think is that, that is like the, the thing, the how is the thing. So we want to be artist-centered to prioritize, you know, perspectives, experience, aesthetic processes of artists as the central tenet of inquiry and action. We want to be emergent, and I think this maybe came up as a question in the chat, what is emergence? To allow something unknown and unplanned to come into being 
through our collective engagement to be pluralistic. So to allow for multiplicity, and this is a little bit is connected to the idea of world making that actually we don't, we are not uh, subjective interpreters of a universally objective world. We actually all live in different worlds that are co-created with through ourself in the worldness. And we need to start engaging in these differences in a pluralistic society. We want to be very process focused because that is what we do as artists. So we're not interested in product. We're interested in what, what the gifts of the processes are and how to talk about those and how to apply those. We want to be imaginative, community minded, adaptive and courageous. And so we just try to as best we can articulate sort of like what we see as like a familiar place of, of problem solving, which is a reactive orientation of institutionally led initiatives where artists are invited to participate. Singular expert driven scholarship and product based outcomes to this space where artists can really thrive in emergent possibilities, these creative pathways to the unforeseen, artist led, but with institutional support. We want to be in these robust relationships with our world pluralistic cohort-based cohort learning. So just understanding none of us can hold all of the perspectives at once and to really focus on process-based discoveries. So we're gonna share with you a slide that is the most concrete of anything that we've said about what we think we wanna do, how we think we wanna work. And you know, you can, you can actually just read it <laughs> for a moment if you like because this is what we want to talk about. So we're trying to imagine a way of mobilizing this work. And, and so we're, we're, we've come together as a cohort. We're calling ourselves tentatively the Public Imagination Network. And this is, these are some of the things that we think we can be supported to do. And, and so you know we'll take a moment to look at this, and then we're going to um, just reflect on it for a second. Shannon, are these slides going to be shared and or can we take pictures? Yeah, the thing. Both? Yeah, both. Go ahead. So we want to engage your imaginations in the in this. And so our, our proposal is that we're going to take two minutes where we'll invite you to respond to the questions that are on the next slide. And we'll, we'll bring that slide back later after you have a chance to capture these questions. So, and I know you've probably been taking notes along the way too. So what ideas are resonating? What's coming up for you? Like, where, where are you? Like, I have no idea what you're talking about, or that's not going to work, <laughs> or, you know, or I have an idea. Like, those are the things that we want to know. And where is your own work intersecting with this conversation? And what would make this so exciting that you had to be a part of it? So we're just gonna give you a moment. If you have a pen and paper, go for it or feel free to use the digital device, but we're just gonna like do this in silence for two minutes. Like just let some of these things digest and have a couple comments. And then we'll give you an opportunity to talk to one other person before we open the room and have a bigger discussion. Um, is everyone good with these questions? Shall I move it back to the other slide? Okay, great. Yeah. All right, so two minutes.
instructions here. So in the online space, we're just going to open the chat to contribute some thoughts and start a conversation in there that we can then probably bring some key points into the room. And in the room, in person, I'm going to ask you to just choose someone else, someone beside you, and, and have a bit of an exchange about some of the thoughts that came up for you. And then we're going to open it into the fuller room and bring some of those highlights into the space. So you'll have another two minutes to chat with someone next to you. It can be in a trio, whatever, whatever works. I know.
Yeah. Okay, everybody. Let us uh, return from our uh, dyads and triads that we were just in. And I think for now, we're going to try to have a more open kind of conversation, maybe coming out of some of those thoughts that came. Thank you so much, by the way. <laughs> so what we thought we would do is uh, start out with some questions that may have come up for perhaps myself, Nassim, or, or Jamie over there, and then we're uh, going to uh, collect questions that come up uh, in the online group and then, you know, read some of those out and get your responses and then, then go from there. That's what okay with everybody. <laughs> um, I will nominate myself to go first. Because <laughs> I had a lot of thoughts, you know, as I was listening. Uh, and I... Um, being a professor, I'm gonna I'm gonna say three questions, and you can just choose any of them. And we'll go from there. Uh, so uh, the first the first one was just on the you, know, you kind of said that kind of sort of value proposition or the inspiration. You know, the world is not as as just and healthy and sustainable as we might want it to be. And then you said, you know, there might be disagreement about that because from assumption, I guess that other people might <laughs> think it is, you know, but that's not the only assumption. The other assumption is that those are the correct values. And those are something like an exhaustive list of the values that should be, you know, guiding our, our, our work. And of course, one could think of many other values that you might include in there. Like maybe the world isn't as beautiful as we'd like it to be. Or maybe it's not as profound. It's a little too shallow. Or maybe it's not as creative. It could be a bit, you know, scripted. Uh, maybe it's not as contemplative as we'd like it to be. Or courageous. Or solidary. Or transgressive. We heard that one. Or free, right? <laughs> so there's a whole range of them. And any subset that you pick will always make one think of others, right? So that's the first question. How, why, why these ones? Or how do we accommodate that level of... Uh, Pluralism that is going to always be there. Value pluralism. That's that's sort of highly abstract kind of question. <laughs> the second one is uh, the other sort of professor hat is I just couldn't help but thinking about John Dewey and the pragmatist tradition in the way you were talking, and I just want to have a reading group where we read <laughs> Dewey and that and that tradition, which is the sort of classical source for this way of thinking about artist process, and that's an experiential buildup. Um, and as you probably know, Dewey's thinking was, in a way, the philosophical inspiration for the WPA uh, in the American Depression response. And coming out of that, we have a, a kind of, you know, 100-year tradition of trying to think about how to, to take those, well, that's the second question, sorry, let's talk about Dewey, right? But the third one is this, right? We have this kind of almost 100-year tradition of thinking about how to take these sort of high ideas about art as a process that can't be separated from from life and questioning the kind of museum model and so on, but trying to make that real <laughs> and come up with policy orientations that could, could make it a lot more concrete. Um, uh, and how do we, and, and so you can even see that sort of like embedded in the words we use. Right? People stopped talking about art policy and they started talking about culture policy to make it broader. And they started talking about creativity to make it even broader, right? Mm -hmm. So sort of situating what you're doing in that hundred years tradition I think it helped to make it a bit more concrete for other people to figure out what it is that you're doing, right? That would be building on that and making it new. What do I mean by that to make it more concrete? Well, I mean, we have, for example, and I'm going to basically be passing the baton to Jamie here. You know, we have like a tradition, for example, of the kind of work that Jamie was very involved in, Art Place America, of trying to say, look, if you're going to, let, let's rethink the model of grant giving, where you don't just give a grant to an individual artist. But you connect that artist, you require that, that artist to be in some sort of collaboration with any kind, any number of local groups. That could be with plumbers, could be with the police, it could be with you know local community groups, it could be with the bankers, and so on. In a way to take this sort of vision, in a way that we could make it you know something that plays out on the ground. <clears throat> now we had a, an event here at the School of Cities about five years ago, where Jamie came and others came to sort of think about the tradition and the policy models built around that and see to some extent 
how far they had come in Canada. And it was interesting that, well, my evaluation of that, and JB, I don't know how you remember it, was not too far, right? There was a lot of work to be done here to try to you know, make, sort of build that kind of thinking into the kind of policy apparatus. But I think I have a feeling that to, to get a hearing here in government, it could be helpful to try to you know, be a bit more concrete in like what specific policy models do we have here that are we think are working, that are not working, what can we adopt from elsewhere? Uh, what can't we adopt from elsewhere? We have to make you know a bit, a bit newer. Uh, and so I think that's an opportunity for us to work together because we have you know people with you know some expertise at the university and surveying the domain of cultural policy broader policy ideas, but then trying to figure out how to take this situated in that. So anyway, that, that's the third one. How do we make it sort of more concrete in a way that like someone in government or business can actually latch on to this? Wow, those are three really big questions. <laughs> I mean, I, I love your first question. I mean, I love them all, but I love your first question around value because I think this is part of the, like, the work of what is the what is the unforeseen? Like, what are the things we're not considering? And part of why focusing on a, a more pluralistic kind of process that allows for that engagement could bring those things up. Like, maybe we have it completely wrong, you know. <laughs> and I think you know some of the reasons that you might expect about why we chose those is because those that that was what um, those are the big things that were unearthed in the pandemic as part of the public narrative out there, you know. Um, but I, I, I think it's a really interesting proposal to just like that uh, all by itself could be its own exploration mm -hmm. that we can design an artistic process around in order to engage across disciplines to think about that, mm -hmm. right? So I love that. Um, I'm going to stick the John Dewey one, <laughs> but, but I feel like maybe you're, you're touching our academic metal a little bit here. And so I, you know, in the during the pandemic, uh, I spent a lot of time reading and deepening my own uh, theoretical understanding around embodied cognition, and really do understand Dr. John Dewey as one of the foundational kind of thinkers. And, and his work was sort of lost for a while, mm -hmm. and not adopted into a mainstream discourse. And now suddenly we're realizing that oh, I think actually there's something to this. And and um, you know, here at the University of Toronto, the director of cognitive uh, sciences, John Verveke is doing some really interesting work in this area. And I, you know, was really excited to engage with his work because, um, you know, embodied practice in particular is, has become the horizon of a lot of these fields. And one of its, one of its sources that is really trying to <laughs> underscore this is, is John Dewey. So, so I appreciate that, but I feel like, um, maybe in the spirit of just being more inclusive in, where we're trying to get to with the conversation is that how do we how do we work together around you know making things more concrete and this is where like you know what we were trying to convey in part in the presentation is to say there is a disconnect of worlds here a bit that actually we as artists too could benefit a lot from deepening our understanding and interactions in public policy spaces and that will help us imagine ways that our creative practices can lend themselves to those inquiries that would ultimately aim to concretize new proposals in the policy world. But right now, like our dilemma is there's kind of like no bridge there and there's no support to build that bridge at, at the moment between artists and, and these very, I mean, sometimes when we talk about like artists want to be more engaged in public policy, it's like, well, that seems like very, uh, like very amorphous idea. And I, and, you know, as someone who has worked quite a lot in public policy, it's like, no, public policy is a very tangible process. Like we understand how laws come into being, like how regulations come into being, it is a tangible process. And so I think even just like that in of itself, trying to work at that intersection more, that we have a lot to uh, offer each other. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, and just to build a little bit on what Shannon was just saying there, I think that that whole idea around, you know, this concept of being pragmatic, right? Like I really pick on that word, like being pragmatic and artists are, you know, uh, you know, this more practice of public policy. But what I think is actually happening is that folks have taken the idea of what public policy is and they transformed it in their own understanding and application of their understanding into something that's more about public 
philosophy, like philosophically what we should be doing as a society, and saying, artists, you're already in the freaking clouds. Like, why <laughs> would you want to be further in the clouds talking about all this kind of stuff? And then comes back down to, no, we're talking about how do we create a, a situation where we have indigenous reconciliation? How do we create a, a situation where artists can afford to live in the communities that get gentrified because they made it cool? Like, you know, so it's like really things where, where the rubber hits the road and where are the spaces that those artists already occupy that can be connected up to the other spaces that other people already occupy. And then on top of that, how do we make all of those spaces occupiable by other people from other spaces? And why do we consider that to be some kind of pie in the sky dream instead of just something that can be broken down once we understand the processes by which people end up where they end up? And I think that that's a big part of why the focus on process is so important and not just about churning out symposia and discussion papers. We've got to do more. I mean, I think it's maybe worth, like, I, I meant to say this in the presentation, but that, like, not all artists want to do this. <laughs> yes, yes we do. Yeah, not all artists want to do this, but the, the, in part, it's because no one pays artists to do this to do this kind of translation engagement in public policy work, but also that there are, there are two capacities, like two really key capacities that are needed to be developed, both of which we don't support currently. One is that artists have to be able to translate their practice into another space, and not every artist knows how to do that. But, you know, we're here as a cohort saying like, hi, we do, and we are. So like, if you're not sure that artists want to do this whole here, we're some artists that want to, there are more out there, we know it, we just like, there's no space for us to say like, we want to work this way. And the other is that like, it's not just artists, it's the arts and culture sector writ large. We just have very weak relationships in the public policy space, even in cultural policy. Our, <laughs> our, we are scattered and chaotic. We are, we are not well organized. We're siloed across disciplines. You know, that has been an issue for a long, long time. So we understand it's these two capacities that need to be developed. How our creative practices can be translated and how we engage in better relationships in public policy space. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for asking all the questions. Are these really the magic number? Because I also have three questions. I want to start with the definition of the artist, with how you began the presentation. Because um, with, with the work I do, like with the research work I do with people in Iran, uh, art sometimes is defined differently as well. Um, and I know we talked about uh, doing uh, in, in my list of public education. There was an era back in the late 90s, early 2000s, that they devoured, the scholarship devoured Dewey. They created stuff from Dewey. Dewey is the best thing that happened to the world and humanity. And then now we are past Dewey. And the problem with Dewey in our scholarship is that he wasn't political enough. So, starting with the definition of the artist, how, because you've also just now mentioned that uh, a lot of artists do not want to do this work. So I would like to go back to your beginning conversations about what does an actual artist mean. Uh, so that's one. Going to my second one, going to the political. I'm I'm hesitant to call my work any longer partnership. For example, I would like to call it globalization. I think we need to step up our game because it can also be an echo chamber. All people in this room and on the online room we all love art we value it we cherish it we want to create this we want everyone to afford Toronto to stay in like vibrant cultural spaces to do what they love and what what is what is the mobilization step that we need and that's where the idea of political comes to mind like how can we make it actually political because it is a political conversation and even Wanting, asking artists to translate their work is sometimes can be oppressive uh, in a way. So that's my second question. My last question, I'm a very naive idealist. I, please excuse me, I'm going to say that out loud. I believe in universal income and I believe that artists need to be paid by tax money and they should not suffer for their art and they should not be artists or um, bartenders so that they can work two hours to do their art. Um, 
Can I just say I asked this question on that panel that I was on? <laughs> My question was, does anyone have any comments about the arts and culture in Canada in 50 years? And what about universal basic income? That was my two-part question. <laughs> and I didn't get that much of an answer. <laughs> Should have asked them separately. Yeah. <laughs> Too much. Yeah. And, like we were talking about public discourse on the arts and art. We also yeah, an income rather than a precarious sector. And you've mentioned beautifully that uh, funds are being redirected from the artists who are doing the actual work to some other whatever organization, like the middle. With that in mind, what can we do actually? Like, how can we mobilize this thing? Uh, the world making, not thing, sorry. Uh, the world making to, to mobilizing how many artists to be salary because they also create work and then they work becomes privatized by a third party and no one has access to that art and public art so if it's publicly funded and publicly available to public what what kind of trans political transformation is that there's a lot yeah <laughs> yeah i'm just trying to say that well, there's okay, there's two things that I would like to respond to, but I'll be more of the first Um, I mean, I guess what's coming up for me is this idea of this like paradigm shift again, like some of it is just artists not being valued. It feels like a bigger value system thing. And so we're not really being reached out to. And so um yeah, I I'm gonna stop there. I, yeah, it feels like um I mean, I've heard that Doug Ford is almost proud. He can't recognize Margaret Atwood, like, you know, like bigger leadership that really doesn't bother. It sort of tri trickles down. It's, yeah, it's, it's, um, or <laughs> I have an artist friend who's sort of the AGO motto, art matters. It almost feels like we're trying to convince everyone that art matters, yeah. for example. Um, so, you know, I, I'm at the beginning of my process of wanting to engage with public policy. So I, but in terms of like sort of feeling, the feeling I get as an artist on the ground is, you know, again, totally in value sort of siloed and not really reached out to. And so I just also just my mind with this kind of feeling. Um, yeah. I mean, one thing that you said around asking artists to try and like their, translate their work um, could be oppressive. And I I feel like what I find is oppressive is that artists who want to translate their work have no space or resources to do that. We're actually not invited to participate as citizens yeah. in, in creating a society that we want. Like we are like as a whole sector and also as as individuals, like you know, artists have a lot to offer this simply because these practices that we engage with, like one of our main jobs is to pay attention. That is one of the main skills and capacities of an artist. And, you know, like, I think it's a hard debate who, who is an artist and who isn't an artist. I mean, there are all kinds of, like, anytime you try to close the box around that, there's like, an, an, a, like there's someone who is standing on the outside of it who identifies as an artist, you know? And so I think that is a bit of a tough, debate. But what I would say as it pertains to this conversation is that we do want to look at where artists are cultivating practices, right? Where we are, where, where artists are really honing a process that that um, has the potential to engage in world making. And so not to say that, you know, if you're not doing that, you're not an artist, but um, but yeah, and around this this thing around political mobilization, there's a lot of political mobilization happening among artists, but again, it's really happening in this activist space. And so we're seeing like, you know, huge presence on social media. We're seeing like artists like in the streets protesting. We are seeing that kind of action. But but like Leslie and I experience, like when it comes to the the spaces where laws get changed or where like an imagination for a different system happens like there's no artists there there's no artists in that space so well not always as participants but often as people who are on the stage providing the service so i know for myself yeah i think part of my artistic practice as a literary artist and spoken word poet is attending conferences and symposium acting as a poet in residence 
So my work is deeply developed in terms of the process of knowledge translation I can take a 45 minute speech in real time and convert it into poetry and present it when the Q&A session is over. Like that is literally part of my practice and I've been doing that for 15 years. Do you think that might have a role to play in a public policy space where we could then take that type of information and present it in a whole in a completely different way that might be accessible to a particular person who's not really down reading green papers for a living? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, if there is a possibility to utilize art in those ways, and it can be more than just having a person who's up at the front of the, of the room doing, you know, um, doing uh, graphic work that's capturing what's happening, which is awesome and, and powerful. But we can go several deep layers deeper than that. And that's really what I think this is about. How do we go levels deeper than that? The folks who are interested and capable and, uh, and excited about doing this type of work. And there's eight of us in the cohort and no more. So that's. So the whole time this conversation has been going on, I've been thinking about the two ways to make policy change that I see that through the bureaucratic side and through the political side. And it's hard to do both. We talked about perhaps, perhaps you're thinking of both, but I'm and I'm hearing both. And I'm but there's also power in choosing one. Um, because political organizing, you don't get invited, you take the space, you get together with many people, and you take the space, and then then the ideas are yours. Uh, Premier Ford was mentioned. Premier Ford took the space. Yeah. Yeah, that was a great organizing campaign. I have to be very careful what I say. But that was like, <laughs> this is but just as a fact, this is people getting together with a similar set of values and taking the space. The other side, which I kind of see more on the slides, but I'm here hearing both verbally. On the slides, I'm hearing more like we are more present in formal policy conversations with the kind of the bureaucratic elements. In fact, more of the folks from the room levels I am kind of bureaucratic. Um, which I think is also very powerful and can be long lasting. It's slower, it's safer, it, it looks at more perspectives, there's not as much conflict. You can get paid for it along the way. Organizing tends, you have to kind of have a big sacrifice up front with organizing. Um, but I think it's worth having a conversation with it, even as a group. Are we doing one, both? Are we going to separate you two? And let's kind of do it this and let's kind of doing that. Because for, for the OAC, if you were doing the one, we could have talked to you about anything, right? If you're doing political organizing, I mean, like, okay, game off. I'm not talking to you about this, or the, the public imagination network, no, no more conversations. But if you're saying, no, we don't do political organizing, we do policy development, and that uh, we want support to go have not cultural policy conversations, that part I love. Like, you're, we're here as artists. Oh, okay, you're going to talk about cultural policy. No, we're not going to talk. We're yeah. talk about the rest of it. So I think that part is really that's you know that fourth question of where do you see me getting excited? That's where I get excited. But I think the first, I think as a group, you might want to talk about the first because it's quicker, exciting, more rebellious, and kind of probably kind of fun, but with no infrastructure and like <laughs> or I should say no infrastructure. There are probably others at the table which wouldn't mind as much. Uh, you know, sitting beside it's much more private. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I just think that's a good, I'm not sure if those conversations have been had, um, and, and that, and that philosophy of inviting versus taking space, I think would be, that's a kind of an important way. Do you just want to take the space? Cause then you probably want to play it one, um, or if you want to be invited and work diplomatically. Yeah, thanks for, yeah. thanks for bringing that up. I mean, I think the way that we've articulated it so far is just that we see a lot of activism on the political side and we see a gap in the bureaucratic thing. Like we, we haven't talked about it using that like political versus bureaucratic language, but but when we talk about like engaging in the public policy process, that like and and you know, through the kinds of relationships that we've made, like public policy forums, relationships with academic institutions, like that that is in the bureaucratic space. Like it and and that is where where I'll just, you know, speak on my own behalf. I think where those creative practices are actually, you know, really robust. You know, when I see a lot of creative expression in the in the political space, yeah. but the but like at the heart of these processes are like how we would we develop 
and imagine a new world and develop an actual policy proposal around that. To me, that lives a lot more in the bureaucratic space. But but yeah, thank you for bringing it up because I think it, it is also a good assumption to test. Yeah, I think the more nonpartisan rather than bureaucratic, yeah. the better mm -hmm. stricter mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. I went so a connection that came up, I guess, for me, and it's interesting. I love I love this conversation, and I feel like I'm here with multiple versions of myself. There's like the, my adolescent self that was a, a musician and and organized with other teenage musicians to organize all ages shows because we couldn't go and play in bars, so we created a world and worlds for ourselves, and we we. We we created a world that was all ages and pay what you can afford, so that we we created an inclusive culture. That's why I just think about all of the artists out there that are creating their own worlds, but not necessarily yeah engaged in that kind of policy or bureaucratic space. Um, but I'm also thinking of the world I spent many years in, the community engaged arts world, which is very much about artists. Uh, not necessarily. I mean, they are in some ways engaging in policy, but artists who are involved at a very local level in using artistic practices as a means of, of, of bringing residents together and co-creating uh, co in, in neighborhoods. And, and, and there's a, you know, a really strong 20, 30 year tradition of that in Toronto is an especially vibrant place for that. And what is the connection of those practices to this idea of artists as, as world makers? Um, we saw, like during the pandemic, a really interesting example of um, Maybell Arts, a community engaged arts organization that transformed itself in response to needs in the community into uh, a food bank that centered like dignity uh, of, of their collaborating residents. They, they, they created a store essentially for residents in their in their neighborhood. Um, they do a lot of work with newcomers and settlements. So there's a lot of uh, structures and practices that exist to to kind of enter into those spaces and and some are engaged in policy and and so yeah wondering about the connection between the this this work and some of those practices yeah that's a great question and i appreciate that you brought that forward because you know i think it is really important to acknowledge community engaged art practice is applying artistic practice and service to like understanding community needs. And I think I, you know, part of where it fits for me, and I realize it's also not like a strict container, but that a lot of community engaged art is in this space of triaging. Like, and it can, I think, migrate into spaces of public policy, but I think a lot of what is happening with community engaged art is is like leaning toward a specific kind of social impact and not necessarily targeting the development of specific policies. And that, you know, I don't want to, like, I don't want to just draw really hard distinctions between those two things. But I think what we're, what we're talking about is like really trying to carve out a more specific space. And there's a ton to learn from community engaged art practice. And I know there's a lot of um, organizing nationally happening around that through the work of Judith Marcuse in the West Coast and around this, this uh, ICAP network. Um, and so like, yes, and yes, and yes, many of the artists who are a part of this cohort also have some um, engaging in our practice that we are that we are involved in as well. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. Do we wanna talk to the online world a little bit? <laughs> what are they feeling? <laughs> well, we've had an ongoing um, flow of you know interesting comments, yeah. um, <laughs> which we we could read some of the comments, or I think some of them have formed themselves into questions too, and maybe you know, start with one was: Is there from Sherry Boyle? Is there a way to do public work as artists without replicating bureaucratic systems? Given yeah, politics, and if those are the main routes towards influence, do you, I guess, to combat the yeah. process of uh, pursuing those? Um, which is a variant of, of uh, another question by Sherry, which is how can our go beyond the individual and affect social reality? Maybe we start with that. that then. Well, Sherry's part of her cohort. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, I think this is all part of like these are the assumptions we're testing in the question we're at, right? You know, like how do we how do we do this? And we don't want to make the assumption that we have all the answers either. Like we really see this as a relational project. So we're, you know, identifying ourselves as people who, if supported, could actually engage very robustly in those very questions with mm -hmm. other folks so that we can learn. And here's another one. We have someone said, uh, I don't know if we said it on here, but someone said, how about building test cities? Is that something that School of Cities <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know. We have, I mean, it maybe Karen's not here, uh, so she can't answer that one. But the, there is a movement, you know, yeah. called uh, I forget what it's called experimental cities or pilot cities, or mostly economists doing that. Oh, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, interesting that it's they they are charter cities, charter cities, what they call it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sorry. And there's a few major, you know, former Nobel Prize winning economists who are going around trying to convince places to start out these charter city movements. I don't know the role of the arts in whatever the charter city movement uh, is. Isn't but, that just the cities that have charters that is legislation that yeah. protects them from interference from other levels? But, it's to, but the idea is to experiment. You can try out new kinds of policy and so right. on, what it normally do in that kind of city. So that anybody who comes to live there sort of signs off and says, okay, I know I'm living in a place that is not going to have the normal <laughs> rules, <laughs> and I'm going to go with it, right, as long as I'm here then. So there's a few places that I've tried it, you know, it's sort of a radical thing, you know. Yeah, an interesting place, like those experiments to like look, to learn from those that are up there. So are you official, can we? Did the artists, you know, like if they have questions? Yeah. Yeah. Like of course, I think I think it needs to be understood that at this moment in time, everything that we're doing is a volunteer contribution to this possibility of actually becoming participants in the system. So so we we like we we are a group of people that is that is fueled by our goodwill right now. And so that is like part of why we want to have this conversation because it's not sustainable. And we, but we see this gap, like, do we want this kind of work to be possible? And so we as a group of artists cannot mobilize this without you. We can't, like we're, we're offering up our best imagination about what we think is possible. And we're inviting your imagination to contribute to make that even better. But but truly, like you know, yes, of course, happy to like answer people's emails and and um, you know, and we are we are like very heartened by the kind of early support and collaboration that we've had, including from the School of Cities, and also through you know some of the others that you see up there, Calgary Arts Development, the Philanthropist, Mass Culture, the National Art Center, and Creation Fund. Like we've all been in these robust conversations um trying to figure out how to do this so that's where we're, we're at at the moment yeah if i could i mean I, I want to follow up on dan's third point about being more concrete so i am not an artist i don't have any oh. creative moments in my body honestly <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna go there <laughs> so i direct the institute on municipal finance and governance that's here at school cities and i've been working in the policy field for about 40 years and mostly with municipal governments, but also provincial and federal government. And I, I'm having a lot of trouble with this because, again, I, I'm not from the creative side. I appreciate it, I, but I, but I, it's not me. And so a lot of these words didn't resonate with me, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. it, so the idea of making it more concrete. So if you want to come together um, because you don't like land use planning in the city, um, that's something that people will come, that's where you'll get people. When you say, this is a policy we're working on, it's quite specific. Um, you've talked about two kinds of policies today. You've talked about policies around artists, whether it's universal basic income or it's the land use gentrification problem or, or uh, you know other things. That's around artists. But I thought you were talking more about big policies, not big, sorry. Um, that's those are big too, but but sort of more universal, not just for artists. So it might be land use planning generally, or it might be 
um, immigration policy, or it might be, you know, something something else. So so for me, I, I would need to see what it is you actually want to fix. <laughs> like, like you've got all these ideas about coming together, wonderful, doing research, wonderful. You know, that's all great, up to what end? And, and, you know, the sustainable, equitable, again, those are words, right? So what, what is it? What are you going to go after? Because you can't go after the whole thing. So that's, that's for me, would be important to actually just say, say what it is that, that you want to fix. Okay. What, what is your name? Enid. Enid. Um, just as something you might feel like you and I are like, oh, totally opposite sides of the spectrum. So, well, that's why I'm sitting here. Yeah. <laughs> to the door. <laughs> I didn't have a table with you, but I can just say that this proposed, like the one thing I didn't say because I was a little bit concerned about saying this because that this was not about create giving you a concrete plan and that, for example, the tool example I gave was sort of just to show what artists are good at is facilitating and observing and integrating. And so we're not at this, we're not at where you want, like I want to be where you want us to be. <laughs> but again, this idea of like going to the band farm and feeling like, in, like just like not understood, like it's hard, our gap is so wide is so wide that what you're asking for is like that's where we want to get to but we we need the support to start this process of but i think you'll get more support if, if it's clear what your goals are that that's all i'm saying yeah no, i understand it's interesting because i you know i so I, I didn't introduce myself i'm liz Forsberg. i work at the ontario Williams foundation and, and work on the partnership team there and, and our mandate is, is supporting the non profit sector broadly at a systems level. And I and I and so I've 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 sit at different tables. I, I spent many years in the arts, but I also spent a lot of time like not not in the uh, not in the arts sector. And I see like interesting um some interesting you know I think like arts funders in the room I understand this and, and actually a consortium of arts funders have been thinking through how do we how do we support this ecosystem where we see artists engaging in broader policy discussions? And, and this is a this is a, a, an organized group of artists who want to do this. And we're figuring how do we how do we meet across the table? I was just thinking, I'm sorry, it's a bit of a lateral thought, but I was thinking about the ways that the federal government has has kind of engaged or invested in interesting challenges. And I don't know if people are, are familiar with like the grand challenges movement or few years ago, the federal government invested a lot of money in this smart cities challenge, and it invited cities to come up with uh, approaches to, to create kind of smart, more networked uh, cities uh, to improve the lives of their residents. And there, there's a lot of support federally for this idea of the challenge. It's, it's a concept that comes from the innovation, the innovation space and innovation practices. And it just occurred to me that that kind of framework might actually be a meeting place between engaging artists in policies and engaging other other policy folks. Um, so this is where my brain is going. Like, what are the existing mechanisms out there that would, where where there's there are pots of funding to be invested that would actually bring di really diverse groups of people together to address some of these these challenges? And that's you know one one space that I can think of right now. Yeah. I'm curious if other folks in the room just understanding that we might be like working from very different positions along the spectrum of like from from abstract imagination to concrete goals like what other suggestions or thoughts are there because like I I hear exactly what you're saying and I feel like this is this is the thing that that artists struggle with a lot because we live in a world that only wants that. And we're trying to articulate that our practices, like if there is already an end that's clear, then you don't need imaginative processes. You don't need emergent strategies. You don't need the gifts of creative process if you just need a plant to get you to where you already know you wanna go. And I think we're trying to say that we have processes that could illuminate things that we haven't yet thought of. And, and I realize that that feels like, you know, to, to folks who are like, 
I want the concrete goal where you're like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, I can't get behind this. I don't understand it. And I think that's what artists are trying to say. We know, we know that the world does not understand this very well, but we do. And we do have something to offer and we want to build the relationships that will help like, you know, bridge that space more. So, so we can translate better so that we're not speaking a foreign language, mm -hmm. but that also, so also so that our practices can become more understood in terms of what they can make possible that maybe isn't already being made possible at this point. Maybe it's a two-step procedure then. Yeah. Right? yeah. The first step is figuring out what policies you're interested in. The mm -hmm. second step is going after them. Yeah, can I mean, let me just, we only have a couple minutes, okay. but, but I do yeah. want to just sort of pick up on what Enid was saying, because I think it's really important. And I think it isn't, well, it would be interesting, I mean, maybe the, a step is to have more of these, you know, kind of conversation where, the, let's say, the way you think about a kind of open-ended project where it doesn't have predetermined goals come together with the way people working on, say, housing policy may think, too. Because at least in some corners of housing policy, we have a school of city housing policy group here, right? And it might be interesting to just, you know, be at the same table. Because the way many people think about housing policy, it does have a strong dose of complexity thinking in it, emergent properties in it. And the problem with, one of the problems we face from the point of view of housing right now is that because it's so expensive, it's very hard for all of the kind of, you know, certain you know like uh surprising things that can happen in a city to happen and so what people want to do is loosen things up some people so that all that can happen right so it's so it's built into a lot of let's say you know nitty gritties dry boring housing policy the idea that we want is unforeseen and unexpected things to happen and we have policy right now or reality right now that doesn't allow that to happen so my point is that you know the idea that we have open-ended systems that need to create space to open up, and that's a feature of like a thriving good city. That's sort of normal in a way, right? And it, there's there's not everyone agrees on that, but it's a big part of housing policy thinking. So if, what what does an artistic dimension add to that? It's an interesting question. I'm not sure, right? Now we do have a decade or two of somebody trying to answer that question. Uh, artscape. <laughs> So, I, and of course, what they have done is, is, is interesting, you know, now it's the way it turned out, we don't know, right? But that's the point is like, that's a real someone who's, when this started out, they thought they had a way to intervene in housing policy that would be favorable to the kind of, you know, kind of serendipitous encounters that make art as part of a thriving city. So <laughs> my point is that's a concrete way in that we preserve both complexity, emergence, and so on. Or engage with housing, we can think about what was wrong, what was right with that, and how to make it, you know, better, right? Yeah. But that's the kind of thing I think he did have to buy. I don't know. That's great. And I yeah. think what you're animating is that, like, the artists will bring the processes. So you can engage us in any number of issues. Like, we're not going to say, we, we only want to work on housing policy. Like, bring us into a process where you talk about housing policy. Mm -hmm. Bring us into a process where you talk about transportation. Like, mm -hmm. it's the processes that we have. Uh, and that's why those relationships are important because we want to know where we can. So, just to just plan on that and adding to your. So, just one um, concrete example is the University of Toronto. I don't know about other higher education uh, institutions, but the University of Toronto has historically to this day been. Uh, using the ranking model based on scientific research rather than artistic and humanity research. Because we, are, we, we gauge our success differently. And that has not been so far until last year, let's say, uh, been translated into universities looking into how are we actually successful within other departments that are not necessarily scientific research or uh, not chemical, uh, medical research, sorry. Uh, so we have been trying to gauge this campaign at this point of faculty these days to have universities think differently about research creation. Mm -hmm. And they are doing that. They're all at least they are open. They still don't know how to measure it, but we are giving them the tools how to measure good, successful projects that are happening in the community and the kind of different impacts that our research, which is very different for faculty these days versus medical science. So um, and so we don't measure it by how many citations we have, but what kind of organizations, how many people, like what kind of communities, what are we actually doing on the ground? So change is happening, concrete change is happening that way, but we are not used to our government or federal government, but small universities. 
Our biggest sun municipality. Yeah. <laughs> that just so we're past our, our closing time, three thirty, but we can continue in the room and chit chat and you know continue the conversation going forward. But let's uh, thank everybody and thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.